Well, greetings and salutations, all of you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. Thank you for being here, my imagination connoisseurs. It is once again I, Robert Meyer Burnett, here to talk to you about geeky stuff, things on my mind, the motion picture industry, the upcoming Academy Awards, all of those things. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say this has been a very interesting week. Uh, a lot of, lot of strange things have happened, but professionally for me, of course, uh, many of you know, if you watch that podcast, we finished the short film Sky Fighter. It's picture locked and it is going to be mixed on Tuesday. This coming Tuesday, it'll be mixed and it'll be finished, which is a, a tremendous feeling. It's like flash dance. Oh, what a feeling. And that's tremendous. And I also got some other great news, as many of you might know. I have been producing, and I've also been editing, and I'm now post-supervising the feature film Tango Shalom. I've been working on this film since 2016. Now, like many independent film projects, they get nudged along as you, as you, as you get the money. And this is truly... Uh, it defines independent filmmaking. Uh, what is Tango Shalom about? I have told people that this is what I, how I like to describe it. It is It pioneers a new genre. It is an indie, Jewish, spiritual quest, family, dance, comedy, fable. That's what it is, because doesn't the world need more of those? <laughs> no, but truly, uh, it is a very special, special movie. And uh, we've been working on it so hard for so long. And it is the last film of actor Joseph Bologna, who starred in movies like Blame It on Rio. And he was in My Favorite Year with Peter O'Toole and a lot of other a lot of other movies. He was nominated for an Academy Award with his wife, Renee Taylor, who you might remember as the nanny's mom. She was Fran Drescher's mom in the show Nanny. Both Joseph Bologna and Renee Taylor, it is their final film together. Uh, they were Academy Award nominated writers, and they were also gifted, gifted, deft co comedic performers. They star in the film, and Gabriel Bologna, their son, directs. Now, what's uh, very, very cool about that is, uh, well, it's not, it's not very cool, but it, it is their last, uh, Joseph's last performance. He he passed away last summer, uh, but he did get to see a cut of the movie. And this week, we received word that we have our finishing funds. So, beginning on March first. Uh, I start working with the sound design team and I will work with our cinematographer Massimo to color time the film and we will hopefully be able to announce some film festival dates in the not too distant future, which I'm very, very proud of. Um, 10 years ago, it's been 10 years, 10 years ago in 2009, I took a horror film I produced, The Hills Run Red, that I worked on with Dave Parker and Dave Scow and and Dirt producer, the Motley Crue biopic, Dirt producer Eric Olson. We uh, had that film, uh, went to many festivals, and it had its debut at the Seattle International Film Festival in May of 2009. So I'm hoping that I can take Tango Shalom there. I guess every 10 years, <laughs> I'll, I'll make movies that go to film festivals. So that's pretty good. Uh, I'm very excited about that. And it's been a good week. And uh, another funny thing that happened is today, Today, it's one year ago today that Gilbert the dog uh, was named Gilbert. Uh, so oh, he barked when I said that. Um, yes, a year ago today, Gilbert the dog, Gilbert the Gilbarian from the planet Gilbar became Gilbert. So that's kind of kind of neat. So anyway, uh, what I wanted to talk about today, I wanted sort of a change of pace, you know, not about the industry. I just wanted to speak strictly about my geeky interests. Uh, and my geeky, specifically my geeky interest in six scale action figures and specifically hot toys action figures. Why, why do I have this obsession with them? Why do I constantly talk about them? How come for most of my life uh, have I been interested in action figures? Like, what is it? Like, what, what would possess a, a grown man? Oh, here comes Gilbert. Wouldn't be a chat without him. What possesses a grown man to, to spend money on plastic figurines of of characters from uh, movies and comic books and all kinds of things. And I wanted to, to discuss that. Now, many of you know, many of you know, of course, that I am a complete fanatic when it comes to Hot Toys figures. Now, why Hot Toys figures? First of all, I think Hot Toys fig figures, they're the Ferrari, they're the Lamborghini, they're the supercar of action figures. Um, to me, 
they're the, the the gold standard, the Tiffany standard, as it were. Tiffany meaning coming from the store. Tiffany, like breakfast with Tiffany's, uh, but uh, breakfast, those kinds of things. But anyway, uh, they you get my meaning. They're like tip top, and uh, you you don't. You, it, sorry, somebody was just calling me, and you don't get uh, uh, better than Hot Toys figures. I mean, there, look, there's people doing custom work on Hot Toys figures that are incredible. But I just want to take you guys back. It all started, it all started for me back in the day when I was a kid. Now, when I was a kid, a lot of you will remember G.I. Joe figures as being three and three quarter inch figures, the same size as Star Wars figures. That came later. Uh, if you watch the great Netflix documentary, The Toys That Made Us, they have a great episode about G.I. Joes. Now, here's the thing. When I was a kid, uh, G.I. Joes were in sort of a transitional phase. They were 12 inch figures action figures, dolls, whatever you want to call them. They were they were dolls for boys, and they were very military-minded. It was G.I. Joe basically came out of the idea of you know, World War II, but because America, uh, the involvement in Vietnam, 12-inch uh, G.I. Joe figures were uh, no longer favored as toys that, tr <laughs> that parents were giving, giving kids. So what Hasbro did was they rebranded G.I. Joe into what they called the adventure team. And the adventure team figure figures were famously given the Kung Fu grip. They had like real hair instead of just plastic molded hair. They had, they had this fuzzy hair and the GI Joes had beards and, and the adventure team were, were sort of the, these Indiana Jones esque guys. They were like, they were, they were kind of a cross between Johnny quest and <laughs> Indiana Jones, even though, Indiana Jones hadn't been invented yet. And they, they, the, these figures, they came with weapons. They had amazing uh, vehicles that they would fit in. Like these, these vehicles were big. Like there's a GI Joe one man helicopter. There was an airboat. There was this sort of ATV vehicle with a crane in the back. There was the greatest vehicle of all time, the mobile support vehicle that two guys could sit up front and it would open up into this mobile command center. That was my favorite. That might be my favorite toy of all time. There was a, a headquarters, and there was all kinds of costumes and suits they made. Uh, the Sea Wolf submarine that that went underground, uh, underwater. You could put it in a swimming pool or a bathtub. It was amazing. Now, here's the thing. I loved G.I. Joe's, and, and I would spend hours, and I'd have friends come over, and we would take over the, the whole house, all the yard, my front yard, my backyard, and we would, we would play out these elaborate scenarios with G.I. Joe's, like in our heads. We'd make up these stories, and it wasn't just like we, we wouldn't take two action figures and what uh, we would make them walk and carry them around. It was very elaborate. What I did not realize at the time was I was making movies in my head with G.I. Joe's. I even looked at my figures. I even played with my fingers as, figures as if my eyes were a, a camera and I was setting up shots because I would have them, you know, come toward me. It was always about trying to, to play with these figures the way I would, would make a movie. So I was really directing movies in my mind. And to that end, there were kids that I would complain about that just, they didn't play with GI Joe's properly <laughs> like when my friends would come over they'd hammer each other on the heads or something i'm like that's not how you, you have to pretend these characters are real after all and at the same time when i was playing with with these gi joe figures i was watching james bond movies and i was i was really starting to to be a young cineast you know it's six and seven and eight and you would get like this people don't remember this but you get the sears catalog the sears wish book there's also the jc penny's catalog i've talked about this before but you'd get this, it was literally a huge catalog that you would, it would come out in like September and it would have all this stuff, but they had a huge toy section. That was all I cared about was the toy section. And in the toy section, frequently like Sears would get a GI Joe exclusive or something. And it might be a hang glider or, or something like that. And, and you would salivate all over this stuff. You'd look at it for months when you're a kid, you'd page through. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I looked uh, at the pages of the Sears catalog and the J.C. Penney's catalog, sometimes like when Micronauts came out, J.C. Penney's had this this battle station. It was like this blue jet with this giant white tower on it. It was kind of crazy, but it was very cool. But so you'd look at these things, and in my mind, on my mind, I was like this producer <clears throat> that needed. I'd, I'd be like, oh, there's a there's a GI Joe 
hang glider, which like I don't have. And in my mind, I'm like, if I had that hang glider, then G.I. Joe could like, like in my mind, I would go to the Grand Canyon in my imagination. And he could he could soar over the Grand Canyon and jump off the Grand Canyon with with that hang glider. And you could stage an elaborate fight scene with, you know, with and by the way, back in the day, G.I. Joe's really didn't have enemies. You know, there was nobody to kill. <laughs> the, the adventure team had like they would find mummies and they would go, you know, there was an octopus if you got the the diving suit, but there was no there was no cobra commander with the adventure team. There really wasn't there was no bad guys. So you you you'd go on adventures. And of course, you know, we as kids, we'd always you'd make somebody a bad guy. You <laughs> you you'd have somebody be an infiltrator or something. I mean, it was so weird to not have bad guys. I guess when you were uh, when it was all military, GI Joe was all military, you could you could pretend like you're fighting the Nazis, but they never really made a wide range of, of Nazi figures. So you'd have to like change it up. But that's how I thought about about making movies because in my head the feeling when I was a kid was I didn't want every toy. Like I didn't want every toy that was made. I wasn't one of these kids that like had to have everything. But I did have to have everything for 12-inch GI Joes. Because that's really all I wanted, but it wasn't. You know, you it, it took a while. You would acquire things for the holidays and for your birthday. You get things, and and when I would see them in my mind, I was playing the 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 stories that I was going to tell once I had that thing. You know, and like I would have like ten stories. The airboat. I remember the airboat that came out. It was really cool. It had like a, it was it was like tr sort of more triangular. It had the pontoons in the back, and it. It was it was awesome. It was like beige and brown, and I'm like, man, I want that jet boat, man, because you know you could have the jet boat find where the submarine was, <laughs> and all if all he had was the submarine, it was like, well, how do you get a boat out there? How do you? What's GI Joe going to do in the submarine? But if you had an airboat too, they could like fight, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it could be like Spy Love Me when when Caroline Monroe was in the helicopter and Bonds in the Lotus Esprit uh, with with a a Anya Amasova, and they're 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 under the water and. The helicopter's looking for them, and of course, they kill Caroline Monroe, which is really, to my mind, a great tragedy. Even today, still a great tragedy. So so 12-inch action figures were a, a very big part of, of my life, and my uh, specifically my imagination, my imaginative life. Uh, it was a big deal. But then what happened was, with the advent, and there were other, there were other action toys. There was like, Mego had Big Jim. And there were there were all there were other action toys with lots of accessories and things like that. But I was a GI Joe guy until Mego came out with their superhero line, their eight inch superhero line. Then I started to shift over and play with superheroes, and and they made both DC and Marvel characters, which was awesome. They eventually made female characters like Supergirl and Batgirl, which was also awesome because I didn't when I was a kid I did not discriminate. If you know you wanted the Justice League, you needed Wonder Woman. I had no qualms about playing with a Wonder Woman figure or a Supergirl figure or a Batgirl figure because they were they were all part of the same thing, man. You needed that stuff. So I you know my parents sometimes batted an eyebrow when I'm like. Yeah, mom, can you hook me up with the Supergirl Mego figure? What's up? And she might think that was <clears throat> a little odd, but uh, I had to have it. But everything changed, as everyone knows, when Star Wars came out. I mean, Star Wars ruled the roost. Uh, you know, suddenly all I wanted to do was... The great thing about Star Wars was you knew that you were watching one small sliver of, of adventures in this gigantic galaxy. So it did not... You did, you, you, your your Star Wars play was not defined by the movie because you knew there was a lot more to it than the film. So when Star you had Star Wars toys, you could go on adventures. I mean, eventually Luke made it back to Tatooine, so you could play with the land speeder. So, but what happened there was it really altered the way I thought about playing with action figures in my own mind. It, it altered, you know, no longer was I worried about getting one figure and buying accessories or or or, or, or outfits because the, they were just molded plastic and they started making a lot more diverse figures but you had problems like you couldn't just get one or two stormtroopers you needed to get like 20 and when you're trying to explain to your mom no mom i need i need like five more stormtroopers because i can't you know there's not enough of them and my mom would be like what what you know and, and i would save up my allowance and go buy more stormtroopers and i think i told the story once the only time i ever shoplifted ever in my life was I found I was at a Payless drugstore in Bellevue, Washington, and there was a loose stormtrooper figure. Didn't have the gun, but the, there was a loose stormtrooper figure that some kid had ripped open, and it was in the aisle, and I I pawned it. I took it. I, I palmed it. 
palmed it and, and put it in my pocket. It was like the longest walk ever. I walked from that the toy aisle and Payless drugstore and walked outside and waited for my mom or something. And and I I stole a I stole a stormtrooper. I did. That's a true story. That's the only time I ever uh, shoplifted from a store. So I'm not proud of it, kids. Don't you shoplift? But I shoplifted. I shoplifted a stormtrooper. But you needed more. Like you just needed more stormtroopers. You always needed more stormtroopers, and people needed to understand that. And I hope you listening to me now realize that even though I committed this this heinous crime, it was only because I needed, you know, I needed it because I needed to play right. I needed more stormtroopers. You always needed. You needed more death squad commanders because basically you needed an army to fight against. You couldn't just have one bad guy. I mean, you couldn't just have Vader. You had to have a whole ship full of stormtroopers. And then they would come out with like the Star Destroyer playset, the Death Star playset, and they had to be full of those figures. You know, the Death Star droid didn't cut it. That was, And you needed more of them too. So I still, I, I played with Star Wars figures. So my action figure obsession began when I was a little kid. Now we're moving into my teen years, getting into my teen years. But one of the things that really bothered me about licensed toys were how shitty they were. I mean, you, you got like the land speeder, you get all excited about it. It was too short. You know, it wasn't long enough. It didn't look like the land speeder in the movie. And I never understood that. I'm like, look, I get it. You're going to have this floating system. So the land speeder can float on, on springs, the spring loaded wheels. That was cool. And I understood that they needed to give these things some play value, but why couldn't the land speeder be just a little bit longer like, I didn't care about it. I'll pick up a land speeder and I'll, I'll move it in my hands and pretend it's floating. I don't, I just want it to look real. And none of it ever looked real. Like, I didn't understand. Like, as a kid, did they think I was stupid? You know, it's it's kind of like I, when I remember, I remember getting the TIE fighter. I've told this story before, but I got the TIE fighter, right? And the TIE fighter, the wings were too stout, too stubby, and they were too far apart. And it, it just didn't look like the TIE fighters that were in Star Wars. And I'm like, why not? Why Why is this TIE fighter white? Why isn't that blue-gray color? Like, why are they making it white? Uh, did they not see the same movie I saw? And I might have been 10 years old, but I was annoyed. I was annoyed. And I wanted, so you know what I'd have to do? This is how insane I was as a kid. Because I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around, I'm holding this TIE fighter that looked shitty. So Estes Model Rockets, Estes Model Rockets made a TIE fighter rocket. And it was really silly because the TIE fighter part, the, the they were accurate. They looked way more accurate. MPC only made a model kit of Darth Vader's TIE fighter. And you had this stupid Kenner TIE fighter that didn't look like the real TIE fighter. But Estes model rockets, they made TIE fighters that looked like TIE fighters. Now, here's the thing. The, the front grill, the glass grill would pop off. And then you would actually put the rocket down the back of the TIE fighter so that it had a long rocket part, but the TIE fighter itself just became the wings of the rocket. So what I told my mom was that I needed to get, I had to get like four Estes TIE fighter rockets. And she's like, four? I'm like, mom, I need four. Like, you know, four that attack the Millennium Falcon. I need four. And I would build them. And so I would get them. I got the TIE fighters and I built them and painted them and they looked pretty good. They were really, really good. They didn't have the veins, the, the ridges that are in the, in the wings of the TIE fighters. I mean, they had the cross beams, but not the internal detail. I mean, I could have scratch built that, but I was like 10. It was going to take the time. So what drove my mom crazy was then I built the TIE fighters and I threw away all the rest of the rocket parts. Now I was a huge, I was hugely into flying model rockets. I kind of still am, but my mom would get upset. She's like, why are you throwing away the, all this, all these parts? And I'm like, mom, I just wanted the, I just wanted the TIE fighters. Cause they looked real. So then I could, I could have my action figures, but then when I, you know, battled in my hands, you know, I had star, star, starships, starfighters fighting each other. I would use my TIE fighter model, my X-wing, my MPC X-wing model. Cause the X-wing toy had the same problem that the TIE fighter toy did. It, was, it sucked. It was a terrible toy. It wasn't the proportions were wrong. It was white. It was, it was bad. So licensed toys were bad. I mean, look at Migos Star Trek toys. Migos Planet of the Apes figures were pretty cool, but licensed toys were just not very good looking. And as a kid, they were insulting to me because I didn't know why I was supposed to be excited about something that they couldn't get right, which is why I turned to model building, which I, I already built models. But, you know, you get the MPC model of the Millennium Falcon and it looked like the Millennium Falcon. When they finally came out with the Millennium Falcon for the Star Wars figures, admittedly, it was cool, but it still didn't look exactly like the Millennium Falcon. So I'm like, why do I want this? Why do I want this? 
So you'd go and you'd build a model of the Millennium Falcon that looked reasonably accurate. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that model kits of the Starship Enterprise were entirely accurate until later, but it didn't matter. Uh, as long as I had model kits that look real, I was okay. But then when they started making 12-inch Star Wars figures, this is like the best of all worlds, right? Star Wars figures that are 12-inch, that had cloth uniforms like G.I. Joe's. I mean, what what more did anyone want? I mean, Mego had made some 12-inch black hole figures and, of course, Star Trek The Motion Picture figures, and those were actually pretty cool. I mean, I don't know why you'd want a 12-inch figure of Anthony Perkins or especially Ernest Borgnine, but you could get one if you wanted it. Uh, so anyway, these 12-inch Star Wars figures, I bought them because they they were reasonably cool. They were still not great. I mean, the Darth Vader was like Roto-cast. Same with like the Boba Fett and then Chewbacca. But they were better than nothing, and they were 12-inch. They brought Star Wars figures back into my favorite preferred sixth-scale format. So that I really liked, and I collected those original 12-inch Star Wars figures. But still, they weren't great. The likenesses weren't great. The costumes weren't that great. The accessories weren't great. They, they were great to have, but even as a kid, I'm still like, why can't you just make these figures look the way they look in the movies? I don't understand. Well, then basically I went to college. <laughs> and and I I up until I collected figures pretty much up until college. And then then I sort of I sort of didn't collect action figures anymore. I I was I was I still built model kits and and collected things. And then in the 90s, Playmates came out with their Star Trek line. And I love Playmates Star Trek figures. So okay, of course, I had to start collecting again and they made uh, basically Mego size. They made these eight inch tall figures that were great. I loved the Playmates eight inch figures with cloth uniforms. They made Voyager, Deep Space Nine, the original crew, TNG. They made great, they were great. So I got back into action figure collecting after, like I'm in my mid twenties now, honing in on 30 and I'm collecting Playmates figures. And, uh, uh, and they did a great job with the Trek franchise. But I figured, you know, that's all I'm going to collect. I'm not going to collect anything else. I'm not going to collect any of just Star Trek figures, and that'll be it. That'll be my that'll be my action figure uh, thing. Then, of course, they decide to start making Star Wars figures again. You know, they weren't making them for a long time. After the Thrawn novels and Dark Empire and Shadows of the Empire, they were slowly re-injecting Star Wars. It was a very clandestine, very uh, very creeping thing that happened. Star Wars figures were coming back, and of course, they made what they do. They made 12 inch Star Wars figures and they made figures like Peter Cushing. They made grand, they made a 12 inch Grand Moff Tarkin, which they'd never made before. I mean, you never could get a Tarkin. I was like, why didn't you make a Tarkin, man? And then they started making more and more and more. And I started collecting. I got back into 12 inch and, and Playmates was making 12 inch Star Trek figures. And suddenly I was back. I was back with a vengeance. I started collecting. 12 inch figures, 12 inch Star Trek, 12 inch Star Wars. And then, of course, other toy companies. Somebody would make a 12 inch Superman that was actually pretty good. And it's like, oh man. So then you'd be like, you'd buy the you'd buy the 12 inch Superman because you know it was just one. It's not like they were gonna make the whole Justice League, right? DC Direct started making little figures that were really good. They looked just like so then I started collecting DC Direct figures, and then, of course, they started making 12-inch figures. And they were like 100 bucks, but they were good. You could get the whole Justice League. And I just I just started – it was bad. I mean, it was – to be honest, it was bad, and there was no way to stop. And and I I just kept going. I mean, they just kept making figures. I'll tell you a funny story. So there was this, there was this girl uh, I had met via editing, and uh, she was really cute. She was actually really hot. And uh, to be honest, I'll, I'll be honest with you, she she came over to spend my spend the night uh, at my house for the first time. And I lived, uh, it's, you can see my house in the movie Free Enterprise. It's the place I was living, I was living on uh, Doheny. And uh, I had a lot of action figures on display, but they were, you know, they were all in cool action poses. So when you came in, like, at least to my mind, uh, they were cool. But she said to me the next morning, she goes, I, I can't, I can't come over to your house anymore. I was like, well, we had a pretty good night. I was like, well, why? She's like, man, there's there's too many eyes staring at me. I can't deal with this. I mean, I'll come over if you put these action figures away. Come on. What was I going to do? I wasn't going to put my action figures away. 
<laughs> and our relationship ended right then and there. But but so so uh, the 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 action figures in the in the two thousands action figures just got better. And there was a whole market like sideshow toys started putting stuff out, and there was a whole market of bootleg action figures. And there were what really started to happen. Like with G.I. Joe figures, military, 12-inch military figures took off. There was a Hong Kong company called Dragon, Dragon Toys. They started making uh, great, great action figures. And then they would Dragon would do like uh, an Enemy at the Gates 2-pack with Jude Law. But they wouldn't call him Jude Law. They made like, like a, a Dirty Dozen and like Where Eagles Dare figures. And suddenly they were making these crazy movie figures. And then, of course, Hot Toys, the first Hot Toys, they came out. And the first toys, there were there were bootleg hot toys. They made like the director, which I have, uh, George Lucas hot toy, which I've shown before. And then they got the license. They started making licensed toys. They got the alien and predator license. And they were called action figure kits. They couldn't be called model kits because other people are action figures because other people had the action figure license. I mean, by this time, by the 2000s, the action figure market was ginormously huge again. But I only collected 12 inches as a throwback to my... I mean, I have my Star Trek figures, but I was only collecting 12-inch figures because I, I went back to 12-inch, and I was very specific. It had to be good superhero figures or movie-related figures, and that's what I collected. But when Star, when uh, when uh, Hot Toys put out their Predator and their, their Aliens, they made the Colonial Marines, they didn't have the likeness approval for the actors for the Colonial Marines, but the, the figures were great, and especially their first Predator figures were unbelievable. And unbelievable. I'm like, oh my God, who is this company that's making these very expensive toys? And and it, that was where my love affair, I want to say it was around 2000, and Sideshow was making everything from Buffy to James Bond toy. I mean, it was a, it was an action figure renaissance that, by the way, has never stopped. Companies, uh, Sideshow was making the Universal Monsters, and they, they were doing all kinds of things. So really, it started in the aughts. Like, I want to say around, you know, 2000. Uh, it was after Free Enterprise came out in, in 99 that action figures began their renaissance. The same way that comic books went through a renaissance in the 80s, uh, action figures went through a renaissance in the early 2000s. And they became really works of art. And Sideshow, as they gathered more and more licenses, they did they did a series of Rocky figures uh, that, are, that are really expensive now. If you get the whole set of Rocky figures, it's like three grand. But... Uh, you know, I, I, I was, I, I, for me, it was only like sci-fi movies. Sometimes they did a Vito Corleone, which is one of my favorite figures of all time. And then there were other companies that came around, Enter Bay, Blitzway. I mean, you can get a two-pack, Tyler Durden two-pack from Blitzway. They made the Sharon Stone figure from Basic Instinct that came out a couple months back. But anyway, the, the action figure renaissance happened. And and what what was interesting to me is is I was... When I was a kid, I was learning, I was teaching myself without knowing it, how to make movies using action figures and telling stories and creating stories. But G.I. Joe's were unto themselves. There was at the time, I didn't, I wasn't into the three and three quarter inch figures and I didn't watch the G.I. Joe cartoon. When G.I. Joe's were sold and, and when I was buying them when I was a kid, they were just G.I. Joe's and you had to make everything up. You know, and then in the early 80s when the He-Man shows came on and they all had commercial support. But with with uh, a, a television show, like, you know, an animated series. And I remember when I was babysitting for the neighborhood kids. I, by the way, I chose which kids I babysat. Everybody wanted me to babysit because I was basically a kid myself, even though I was in high school and I loved playing with the kids and stuff. But I would pick the kids I babysat with based on who had the coolest toys. That was else something I did. Like uh, the Falquists and the Pettigrews. They all had great toys. You know, it was awesome. And and it was fun because I could play with toys that I wasn't normally buying, like the He-Man toys. So I would I would I would be able to play with the kids with that he had He-Man toys. And we'd set up these elaborate, you know, scenarios where Castle Gray Skull would be one place and we might be off somewhere else with Man at Arms and that cool Wind Rider and 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 we'd have to get there. We'd spend the whole time when I was babysitting playing these scenarios and working our way back to Castle Gray Skull or whatever. It was great. And uh, it was, but it was weird. There was something I noticed. These kids, I'm like, I would be like, you know, what if, what if one day, like He Man becomes possessed and is evil, and Skeletor became good, and the kids couldn't handle that. They're like, we, that's not what happens on the show. We can't do that. Like they couldn't, they couldn't play with their toys in a different manner than they had seen on TV, which I thought was really interesting. 
Um, I'm like, all right, well, I never watched the show, so I'll just go with that. And I assume you're telling me how to do it right. But but now the action figures are so good. Like the reason I'm still buying action figures today, the reason I still like Hot Toys figures. I mean, this week they just announced today Hot Toys is making a Commander Cody from the prequels, the Star Wars prequels. Now, Sideshow did a great job making their uh, clone army. Uh, great figures. Great. They're still making great 12-inch Star Wars figures, but the license is split now. Not split, but Hot Toys has a license and Sideshow has a license. And um, But Hot Toys had, had not done a Commander Cody. It's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. They announced that figure today. They also announced the deluxe Captain Marvel um and, and and the deluxe comes with a leather jacket it comes with a head that looks like when she's blasting in space with the with the energy mohawk and uh it comes with goose her cat goose and in the, in the comic book series captain marvel's cat is chewy and of course is famously revealed to be a flurkin a flurkin is a is a is a very actually powerful and almost omnipotent creature that just looks like a human house cat but it's not in the movie they've changed the character, the cat's name, instead of Chewy, for obvious reasons, they're not going to call him Chewy. Uh, he's called Goose, and I'm, I presume he's called Goose after Goose, Anthony Edwards' character from Top Gun. But apparently, people say the cat steals the show, which leads me to believe that Goose the cat is indeed an alien flurkin, which makes me even more excited to see the Captain Marvel movie. But this Captain Marvel action figure, these action figures that Hot Toys makes, are so good. That in my mind, the reason that they inspire me, especially if you get all the Avengers and you line them up on a shelf, all of those characters, as I've said before in a previous video, you can watch a video uh, on the Bird Network. It's one of my first videos I ever posted about my action figure collection. I did it for the 100th episode of Heroes when I was doing it with John Schnepp. But Hot Toys figures represent actors, costume designers, directors, writers, all of the people that I admire working in motion pictures. They are representations of all the work those people are doing. So now Hot Toys figures have become a uh, huge, huge sort of emotional support, if you were, if, if you will. Like, like I started this chat by talking about how Tango Shalom had been working on this movie, this independent movie, for almost three years. Just like we worked on Hills Run Red, another low-budget indie movie. Well, not indie. It became a studio movie. But it started out as an indie movie. And, you know, the, these, these action figures inspire me to keep going you know when i get mad or i want to throw in the towel or somebody sues me uh i i really i i keep these action figures close and and i have them displayed because they remind me what i want to be doing with my life which is also creating characters and and making movies and hopefully inspiring other people through the work that i'm doing now i've never made a movie yet that really has an action figure although somebody should make i've seen i met a guy who made a baby face action figure from uh, Tills on Red, that's amazing and custom. But why they've never licensed out Babyface, I'll, I don't know. But really, what it really comes down to is the reason that I love Hot Toys figures so much is they're so great and they're perfect for the most part. The facial sculpts are perfect and they've been getting better over the years. I mean, they're incredible. The characters have pores now. They literally do action figures that have pores. They're so lifelike. You can pose them, you can take pictures of them, you can create scenarios of them. There's a lot of people that do great artwork online, there's great custom figures people are making figures that aren't licensed, uh, but you can get, I mean, they just made a, a sideshow, made a Jack Burton action figure. There's a, to follow up their, their snake Plissken action figure, but I've, I've made the, maintained the, the, the 12 inch figures. I love hot toys. They are awesome. And they're, to me, they have become action figures, which inspired me to want to tell stories and create them in my mind and learn how to visualize things. It's now gone full circle. Now that I'm working with movies uh, and working on movies, action figures have become the fuel for my creative fire. When they come out and there's a great one, a great... Uh, and I don't necessarily have to have every action figure. I just want to get the best representation of that figure possible. I don't need, you know, five different... A lot of people collect all the Hot Toys Iron Man armors. I only want, like, one because I'll set them up and... Like, I do really want, I have a, a few, like, I've got the Diecast Iron Patriot and the Diecast War Machine and the Diecast, uh, a few, I've got a, a Iron Man 3 armor. I, I, I got those along the way, and then what, what's great is, is when new ones come out, I trade, they, have, they keep their value, so I, I'm always trading them in, so I don't really have to buy 
I haven't bought many new figures over the last couple of years just because money's been tight since we moved in here. But uh, it's it's I can still trade or or you get credit for the ones that you've bought. Like I got my Hot Toys Vision figure for free. Uh, but anyway, uh, they've become action figures have become inspiring to me because they do represent all the great work that so many disciplines that are required to make a movie contribute to, whether it's, like I said, costumes and acting and design and visual effects and all of that. So I went from as a child playing with action figures to now as an adult being inspired by action figures. I don't know what that really says about me, but um, that's it. That's, that's the attraction. And uh, that was what I was thinking about talking about today. So, you know, I just thought that would be an interesting change of pace. It's Friday. Uh, I had great news all the way around with finishing the the short film and getting the go-ahead to move into the next phase of post-production for Tango, where we we're actually going to finish this movie. And I'm very, very proud of Tango Shalom. So that's it. That's what I want to talk about. Let's see what you guys have to talk about. Topher Rocks is here. Topher, what is up? Hey, Rob. Gus Fring. Siler from Heroes, Wilson Fisk, and the Trinity Killer Dexter are my favorite TV villains. Do you have a few? Those are all very good. Gus Fring from Breaking Bad and, and Better Call Saul. Uh, <laughs> what a great villain. And perhaps the greatest, spoiler alert, demise of any villain in television history. Unbelievable. I think one of my favorite villains of all time is Gul Dukat. From Deep Space Nine, Mark Alamo's Gull Ducat. He's fantastic. Stringer Bell, uh, Idris Elba's character in The Wire. I love Stringer Bell. Uh, Wilson Fisk is great on, on Daredevil. Vincent D'Onofrio's Wilson Fisk, fantastic. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, th those are all good. I, I can't think of any other like villains off the top of my head. Um, I'm trying to think of, of shows that that I, I loved and, and the villains in those shows. I mean, you know, I like, I like the half the villains in, in Buffy, like I, I spike, I loved spike. What a great character, like the gentleman in Buffy. There's some great stuff in there. Of course, there's been great antagonists in star Trek and uh, so many to name. Uh, but those are some of my favorites. Um, Willow. Hello, Willow. Willow, Willow. Will Yang is here. Which hot toys are currently at the top of your wish list? I'm in love with the Carl Urban Dread figure you had on the Weekly Hero. Remember that that Carl Urban Dread figure is a bootleg. It is not a real action. It's not a licensed figure, which is kind of funny. It's awesome. Now, for you guys, I'm you know I've just decided to start supporting my favorite retailers, even though I don't get. I, I want to be clear. I don't get sponsorships from them, although they should sponsor me. Uh, like David Miller, by the way, I said Dennis Miller, David Miller from Sirius Rocketry, Sirius like the star. He, uh, he's great. I call him Dennis, but David Miller is great. If you like model rockets, Sirius model rocketry, they make the five foot Saturn five that I'm actually began working on again because it's the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. And I'm going to launch, I've had this five foot model of the Saturn five for 10 years. I got it in 2008, and I started building it, and I made a mistake. I will admit that. I made a mistake with the engine mount because it was a, the biggest engine mount I ever dealt with, and there's wires and stuff. And I made a mistake, and I had asked, I had asked David Miller to uh, – he, he forgot about me, but I had asked him to, to replace the engine mount parts, and he had to make more kits this year. So out of the blue one day, this box just arrived from Sirius Rocketry with all the parts I needed and some special surprises, which was great. But uh, if you want to get that Judge Dredd figure, there, there are places, there's a, there's a great place called the Monkey Depot. The Monkey Depot. There's a lot of, of action figures that come out, mostly out of Hong Kong, that are, are, are bootleg figures because, you know, is there enough of a call? The reason certain figures don't get made, like the Judge Dredd figure, the Carl Urban Judge Dredd figure, is because the, they don't feel that there, there's uh, any call for it. And what's interesting is it's true. Because Hot Toys will put out a one-off. They'll do like the Crow, which is an awesome figure. The Hot Toys figure of, of Eric Draven, uh, Brandon Lee as the Crow is great. It's a great figure, and I'm so happy to have it. But not many people bought it, unfortunately. Uh, I was really looking forward to getting all of the Watchmen from the movie Watchmen. And, and Hot Toys put out the Comedian, and they put out Silk Spectre. And that was it. There's no Rorschach, there's no Night Owl, and there's no Dr. Manhattan. 
uh, which sucked. I wanted all five of the Watchmen, but they don't. If the first two don't sell, and here's something really interesting about the Hot Toys um, uh, comedian figure: his smiley face pin on the actual Hot Toys figure is just a blank yellow pin because that smiley face is owned. You'd have to license that logo, and Hot Toys wasn't going to do it. You know, they had to license it for. Uh, I don't know when. I don't know when that that was turned into something that had to be licensed. But you have to license a smiley face. Like if you're going to put a smiley face pin in a movie, you got to license it. I didn't come after you, but yeah, that Carl Urban figure Willow is, is awesome. And, um, Willow told me a funny story. She sent me an email, I think on Patreon, by the way, thanks for being a Patreon supporter, uh, that she has a cousin named, named Yang Yang, <laughs> which I thought was, was great, but it, it's a different meaning. She said it mean, meant more ocean as opposed to Willow, but I just think that's great. You know, one of, one of the great things that I want to learn to do in my life, and I'm never going to learn to do this because it's going to be impossible, is I want to learn to speak Chinese, you know, kind of like in Firefly. I'd love to learn to speak Mandarin or, or Cantonese, uh, probably Mandarin. I don't know which which is best, just so I could watch Wong Kar Wai movies in their original language. Um, well, Brandon says, the Ragnarok hot toys are so effing dope. Brandon, you are correct. I do not have any of the Ragnarok hot toys, but they are dope. I specifically want to get Gladiator Thor and most of all, Gladiator Hulk. Uh, the Gladiator Hulk is huge. He comes with his Gladiator armor. It is awesome. I would love to get that figure. It's like 350 bucks, you know, but really, uh, just so you all know, any any m monies that I make here on the internet goes to paying my bills and things like that and, and buying more equipment for the channel, which I have. I'm still trying to figure out how to use all the Wirecast stuff that John Campia has that I've been able to purchase. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out, which I'm going to work on this weekend, and I'm going to up my chats to the next level. Um, Mark C. says, thank you for helping me with my Star Trek The Next Generation purchase. What a steal. Uh, what Mark is, you are correct, sir. What Mark is referring to, I believe, Mark, you came to me on Twitter today and asked about buying the UK versions of Star Trek The Next Generation on Blu-ray. Um, as many of you know, I produced all the special features for The Next Generation Blu-rays uh, in the high-definition special features, of which there are many. Uh, I did that with Roger Lay Jr. and worked with the Akutas, who were overseeing the project. But apparently, Mark found on Amazon UK or someplace in the UK, 65 bucks for all seven seasons. Now, if you break that down per episode, there's 178 episodes, well, 176 episodes, if you include Farpoint and All Good Things is one episode, but they were split up in broadcast form. They're on the they're on their original 90-minute uh, versions on the, on the Blu-rays, but there were 178 episodes of Next Generation, and they're all on the disc. So our special features, which if you include... All of the audio commentaries is probably about 50 minutes of special features. I mean, 50 hours, pardon me, 50 minutes, 50 hours and fantastic. So Mark found these, these UK discs and they're region free. So if you, you don't have to worry about different, different regions, uh, they're great. So I highly recommend them. Mark found them as uh, got them as for a song and a dance and they are worth it. So I'm glad you, you picked those up because they are tremendous. Um, Jedi Knight and friend of Captain Solo says the Alita hot toy is sick. Also thoughts on Enterprise. I love that. Okay. Well, first of all, the Alita hot toy is sick. I can't wait to get that if I like the movie. So here's the thing. Some, you know, I, I used to buy like every figure that came out, but as I get closer to my own demise, my own death, I'm like, it's kind of the point where all my collectibles and graphic novels, I'm thinking like, maybe I should read them one more time and then start getting rid of everything because, you can't take it with you. And I'm going to leave behind this collection of hundreds of action figures and people are going to go, what the hell are these? What? Who want? What? But uh, that day hasn't quite come around yet. Um, but it's coming. I mean, that day is, that day is coming. Uh, uh, oh, and what do I think about Enterprise? You know, Enterprise is really hit and miss for me. I, I like a lot of it. Of course, everyone likes the fourth. I think the fourth season of Enterprise is great. And if it was like that the whole time, you know, in the special features for Enterprise, we did uh, <laughs> Rick Berman and, and, and Brandon Braga joked that they only made the first three seasons of Enterprise so Manny Cotto could come along and take credit for making the show good in the fourth season, which I always thought was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, I like Enterprise. And, and, you know, like I talked about an episode called Cogenitor, 
that I think is 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 great. There's a there's you know Enterprise was they didn't they weren't even allowed to make it the way they wanted to make it really, but the third season the Zindi arc is fun. I mean it's really interesting. It's not very Star Trek, but it's it's really it's interesting. And you know once you get past that stupid Nazi arc space alien nazis from the end of the third season the beginning of the fourth season the fourth season of enterprise is really the vulcan arc the art with nuni and sung and his his followers and uh, or or the the ancestor of nuni and sung all of that stuff is is really interesting stuff and in a mirror darkly the mirror mirror universe episode is the mirror the mirror universe episode that's also a sequel to the tholian web it's great um uh, so I enjoyed the fourth season of Enterprise. Highly, highly enjoyable. Um, Abdul says, Abdul's here. Hey, Rob, this is my first super chat. Well, Abdul, thank you. It looks like you're from the UK. Uh, I want to say thank you for a super chat. That's very nice of you. Um, and your question is, hey, Rob, uh, this is my first super chat. If Batman was in Star Wars, would he be a Sith, Jedi, Grey Jedi, or Mandalorian? Love you, man. What an awesome question. Uh, I like this question, Abdul. What a cool question. Um, what would Batman... You know, I mean, I think Batman would probably be a Mandalorian because he would kind of be... But, you know, Mandalorians... The Mandalorians were obviously the warrior a warrior class, and but I think I think Batman would be like Boba Fett, but Boba Fett would be the, you know, like the Dark Knight detective. He would he would be righting wrongs and his, his armor would all be one color. <laughs> Uh, I like that question. I uh, I don't think Batman would be a Sith, and he wouldn't be a Jedi because he wouldn't be part of the Jedi Order. He'd be a loner, you know, like he is now. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it, wouldn't that be cool to see like a rich Bruce Wayne in the Star Wars universe? Like he's he's as rich as the Huts, you know, but he's also a Mandalorian, a lone Mandalorian warrior, righting wrongs on the outer rim. Probably kind of like a lot like the Mandalorian's gonna be. I think that's uh, that's really uh, that's actually a really cool idea, <laughs> and I'm now obs- I'm going to be obsessed with the idea. Uh, Brandon asks Rob, "What kind of cameras do you own?" I recently brought a bought a Leica and love it so much. You know, I don't own many cameras. I, I don't have I do not have a still camera at all. I have a few video cameras, but they're older, uh, Sony and and Panasonic. But I I you know normally when I I do a project. Uh, uh, I either buy a camera for that project because they usually get, when we did uh, the, the documentaries for say Chronicles of Narnia, I bought five Panasonic DVX 100 A's, which are, they were HDV. They shot with HDV tapes. They're high def, but they were, they were workhorses, man. I bought five of those and we took them to New Zealand and we had them there for 14 months and they got beat to shit. So, um, you don't expect when you go on long uh, travels. I took them to, to uh, when I was doing Superman Returns, it was really interesting. Those cameras, those those, those uh, Panasonic cameras were not HD cameras. We were still shooting in standard def. And during my time on Superman Returns, they made they made the first high def cameras actually that, that shot to HDV tapes. There was DV tapes, which is what I was using before. And then there were HDV tapes. And now everything is shot digitally to cards. But... Um, during Superman Returns, I was able to switch from standard def to high def. So by the time we got back to Fox Studios, I had ordered and I had shipped to me uh, two Sony Z1s that were the first HDV ta- uh, HDV cameras, prosumer cameras, and they're great. But now, you know, there's so many great cameras out there. I, I tend to like to use uh, dedicated video cameras when I'm shooting documentary stuff because they're easier to handle as opposed to, to DSLR cameras. Uh, a lot of people still use DSLR, but and the color space is getting better and better and, uh, all the time, obviously. But I, I really prefer, uh, I love Panasonic video cameras. And whenever I can, I use Panasonic video cameras, Canons and Sonys. Uh, and on the film projects that I've worked on, they have been either airy or red. All the projects I've worked on in the last pretty much the last decade were either airy or red shows. So, uh, yeah. And that's, that's that question. Uh, Mark asks, uh, Mark says he would love to see a comic book accurate crow figure complete with punk hair. Yeah. I mean, that would be jail bars, original crow comic. That would be cool. It would be, I mean, somebody would have to make that as a custom. Probably somebody probably has. I'll, I'll, now I want to know. 
I want to look it up. Uh, Jane1138, I love that as a reference to, of course, George Lucas's science fiction opus, THX1138. Or maybe you're talking about where they transfer the prisoners from in Star Wars, prisoner transfer from 113, cell block 1138, I think they say, which is also a reference to, of course, THX1138. So that's a good name. Jane1138, I approve. Huge free enterprise special. Huge free enterprise and specials fan. Discovered the flicks via VHS promos back when I was the video buyer for Tower Records in Bellevue, Washington. Oh my God! As you know, I'm from Seattle. I'm from Mercer Island, and uh, I the Tower Bellevue was I when I work. I used to work at Silver Platters actually, up the street from well, a little ways up the street from Tower Bellevue. Man, do I miss Tower Records! If you guys haven't seen Colin Hanks's documentary about Tower Records, I think. I forget the name of it. All things are lost, or so, it's not like it isn't that. It's something like that. It's so good. Like if you, I Tower Records. First of all, Tower Records in Seattle was a big deal. Like I, much of my youth was spent at the Tower Mercer Street, flipping through the uh, record stacks in the import section. I found so many. I bought my first New Order CD, uh, uh, Low Life, the first import New Order CD that I ever owned at Tower. You know, I discovered bands like all my 4AD CDs, Clan of Zymox. I mean, I only, I was a total snob. I'd go to Tower Records and I only bought import discs and vinyl because everyone knows import vinyl is the best vinyl. Um, thank you for being a free enterprise and specials fan. For those who don't know, um, I was an associate producer on a movie called The Specials that was written by James Gunn. I was a producer on it, but then I left the company. I didn't leave. I was actually drummed out of the company that I, that I founded. Um, over a dispute when my my partners recut Free Enterprise without me knowing, even though my cut of the movie is the one that exists. But yeah, they recut Free Enterprise without me knowing. I got mad and uh, I left the company. But while, while I left the company, we were in the middle of producing a movie called The Specials that James Gunn wrote about the, I think, the eighth, the eighth best superhero team in the world. If you guys haven't seen The Specials, I've talked about before, it's got Thomas Hayden Church in it. It's got Rob Lowe in it. It's got Paget Brewster in it. James Gunn himself plays Minute Man. His brother Sean Gunn plays a. He his brother Sean eats butter like it, it eats a big stick of butter in the movie. Uh, it's it's pretty wacky, and it was directed by Craig Mazin, who wrote the Hangover movies. If you haven't seen the specials, look it up. Hopefully, it'll be coming out on Blu-ray soon. I'm trying to get Free Enterprise out on Blu-ray, but. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you, Jane, 1138, uh, liked the movies. Thank you for that. And boy, that Tower Records. Uh, I found one of my dream uh, my dream film projects in hardcover. I read the book. I have a screenplay for it. I'm trying to get it made. It's called The Jehovah Contract. I believe I found it at Tower Records in 1987. And I've been in love ever since. And I'm still trying to make that movie. Uh, Mark C. asks, every Star Trek show really didn't get good until the third seasons, except the original series. The original series, its third season famously was bad. Uh, but I don't think it's third season. There's a lot of good episodes there. Um, and Enterprise did get screwed. I think Enterprise got screwed by Les Moonves. Uh, as I've told the story before, Les Moonves wanted Rick Berman. This is a story Rick Berman told me himself. Uh, Rick Berman was Les Moonves wanted Rick Berman to fire Scott Bakula. And Rick Berman basically told Les Moonves, fuck you. I'm not going to fire Scott Bakula. And when Enterprise was over, Rick Berman could not get any of his projects, his new projects, any traction at the studio. He had a development deal for a couple of years. And eventually, uh, because Les Moonves blocked his every move, and eventually he just simply retired on all that fat. I can't even imagine how many hundreds of millions of dollars Rick Berman must have made off Star Trek, but he did. So that's a true story, by the way, about uh, Enterprise. Uh, let's see what anybody else has to say. Uh, Trinidad the Island Man says, Tango sounds like a good movie. Whenever you mention it, I think of that Gene Wilder, Harrison Ford cowboy movie. Oh, man, what was the name of that movie? I forget. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it, you know what? Tango Shalom is a it's a very sweet movie. If it was rated anything, it'd be rated G. I'm really proud of it. It has a really good message. It's it's definitely a family movie, and in a way, it's sort of faith based, um, and it's become strangely political. 
when we started it, Donald Trump hadn't become elected. He wasn't elected president yet. And Tango Shalom has this weird, it's not weird, but a definite undercurrent of inclusion and religious tolerance and, and freedom. And it's, um, uh, it's, it's almost like a political act of defiance in a way, sort of, which is sort of interesting. Uh, Nicholas Glenn asks thoughts on DS nine. It was one of my favorite series and had some of the best action. Where are those writers at? Well, what's interesting, uh, a lot of the writing staff from deep space nine went on to much greater things. Of course, Ron Moore had come from TNG to deep space nine and he created along with David Icke, the, uh, remake of Battlestar Galactica. Now he's on, I believe outlander. And, uh, of course, Naren Shankar went on to CSI and, the the writing staff of, of that show has gone they've gone on to become some of the greatest TV writers in the business. I love Deep Space Nine. I dearly love Deep Space Nine. And I've often maintained that, and I stand by this, that of course the sixth season of Deep Space Nine is the strongest overall season of all of modern Star Trek. And it's uh, it's terrific. Oh, I wish Discovery had the kind of writing that they had in Deep Space Nine. Too bad they don't. Um Writer B.L. Ali says David Tennant was chilling as Kilgrave. Man, I loved David Tennant as Kilgrave on Jessica Jones. Wow, what a show. What a character. I also love David uh, Tennant on Broadchurch. If you haven't seen Broadchurch, he, he, he kills it on that as well. Uh, Real Girl 120, 126 says, I'm ready for Captain Marvel. I'm excited for the music that might be in it, even though it will take place soon in too, too soon in the 90s for Creed. <laughs> I like that too. I think, you know, I think of the great 90s soundtracks for movies. Of course, Singles is one of the great 90s soundtracks. The soundtrack, there's two soundtracks for The Crow. There's Graham Ravel's music, and then there's the, the, the soundtrack of music from The Crow, like that begins with The Cure's song, Burn. That's a great soundtrack. Like Judgment Night <laughs> has, a great, has a great soundtrack. So I'm really looking forward to the 90s music in uh, Captain Marvel. I think it's going to be great. I think it's really going to be uh, exciting and uh, really looking forward to that. <laughs> Let's see. Bunyan Snipe is here. Hi, Bunyan Snipe. Uh, I think in a film version, they should keep the name Adam. Oh, you're talking about a He-Man movie. Uh, you know, there was a really great script that you can find online, and I want to say it was written by Mark Protosevich, Pr Prosevich. I don't know how you pronounce his name. I think it was written by him, but it's called Grayskull. And if you want to read a pretty dope He-Man script, Grayskull was pretty cool. I remember it being pretty cool. Of course, maybe my mem memory is cloudy because I read so many damn scripts. Um, but Adam's what people call him, set 20 years after Keldor kills Randor and becomes Skeletor. Man Bunyan, uh, you, my friend, I, you, know, you know more about He-Man than I do. I love that, but it sounds good to me. I'd watch that movie. Uh, Flick Talk says, yeah, we probably disagreed. Nothing wrong with that. Personally, I think that people were upset about her for, oh, I think, are you talking about, oh, Brie Larson. Look, I don't subscribe. I think people should be able to believe what they want. Brie Larson is not Captain Marvel. You know, this weird thing, like, I, I understand people are, we're vilifying people now, and if we vilify them, then the things that they're in or whatever they've done terribly wrong makes makes it hard to listen to or hear or watch or whatever. I get all that. But man, you know what Brie Larson, Brie Larson's heart's in the right place. It really is. I mean, this idea, inclusion and getting people opportunities that might not have opportunities is never a bad thing. You know, it, it's never a bad thing to give people the ability to, um, to, to try and achieve their dreams. Because it's my belief that my guiding principle of life is it doesn't matter how good somebody else is. It doesn't make you any better or any worse. You know, I mean, all you can do is be the best person you can be and do what you can do. And there is, despite everybody, everybody's all in a, in a twist all the time now, but there's more inclusion and there's more diversity and there's more opportunity for everybody than ever before. You know, and I'm not saying everybody's equal now, because certainly not. I don't think any, any, any person who's black in the United States will tell you there has never been true equality. Never, 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 never. And uh, I completely understand that. But there's more equality and more inclusion than there's ever been, and people need to start taking advantage of that. And I don't think it's a problem when Brie Larson says, look, I want to be able to have a more diverse um, group of people, uh, more diverse critics, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's, it's you know, there isn't a lot of it, – it, 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 
again, as I've said also, being inclusive should not mean you then go oppress others. We all need to move forward together. Trading one oppression for another is never a good thing. You know, and I understand cis white males like myself are going to be vilified for a while. And I get it. We're in a transitional period. So it doesn't bother me when Brie Larson wants to offer people that have been marginalized in the past and give them an opportunity. I'm all for that. I am all for opportunity. I'm not for a quality of outcome, certainly, because I don't believe we are all the same. I don't believe that we are all equal as biological. I mean, mankind is equal. Human beings should morally and ethically be considered equal to one another. But as I've said before, I would never play basketball as good as LeBron James. <laughs> and I understand that. I get it. If, if it was me and LeBron James going up for the same position on a, a basketball team on the Lakers, LeBron James is always going to get that, that position, and I'm never going to get that position. And that's okay. You know why? Because our abilities are not equal. <laughs> They're just not. And what I need to do is do, I've got to go find what, what suits me better, which is film editing or, or talking on YouTube. <laughs> you know, um, by the way, I, I don't know if you guys know, Will Smith does story time and he, I just, I love his story time videos on YouTube and he does one on becoming the fresh Prince of Bel Air. And I just saw it and, and it just popped up in my feed and I watched it. It's only like five minutes long. You got to watch it. It's hilarious. It's a great, it's, it's one of my favorite stories I've ever heard about how you get somewhere in Hollywood. And it's also, in my experience, very true. So good on Will Smith for that story time. Um, <laughs> Magic K asks, what is my opinion on the Orville? Magic K, you know, I have to tell you, I, I, I have found the second season of the Orville a bit hit and miss. There's been, I think, too many domestic stories about about our crew and not enough bigger allegorical sci-fi stories where our crew, we learn about our crew and they deal with a much more external, larger sort of a threat. Um, but I mean, I appreciate what they've been doing. It's just, it feels a little small this season, a little ship bound to me. Um, and you know, it's, it's all these interpersonal relationship stories. I'm, I'm kind of burning out on, but you know, I still really enjoy the characters and I really enjoy the, the cast itself but i'd like to see them do a little bit more with it i've not seen last night's episode though looking forward to it mark c says uh do you have a p.o box i do not but i'm happy to provide you an address you can write me at uh send me an email at rm burnett 1701 at gmail.com and uh yeah Keldon Sound says, love your channel, Rob. You're a man of refined taste. <laughs> had, a touch of had a touch of 90s music in Iron Man 3 and the disaster artist. Loved it. Can't wait for Captain Marvel. Neither can I. I cannot. I am deliriously excited for Captain Marvel. I usually buy tickets to see it the Thursday it opens. Uh, unfortunately, I was late to that ball game. I have tickets to see it on the Friday. It actually opens in the Cinerama Dome where I like to go see the large superhero openings. And I'm very excited. So, yeah. Uh, Nicholas Glenn says you just re he just recently watched the director's cut of Star Trek The Undiscovered Country and had forgotten what a great movie that was. Thoughts? Uh, you know, Darren Dockerman, one of the inglorious Trek experts, is not a fan of Star Trek VI. And he always talks about why he's not a fan of Star Trek VI. And I tend to agree with him, but I love Star Trek VI. You know, I mean, I understand I don't think Kirk would be that much of a racist against Klingons, even though they did kill his son. And I understand the whole Cold War allegorical structure for it. But, man, it's a fun movie. I mean, it, there's so many things in Star Trek VI that I love. I love when Chang is, like, prosecuting McCoy and Kirk, and he's like, don't wait for the translation. Answer me now. I love that. I, I There's so much stuff. Even though, like, Spock slaps a, what, a Velcro? <laughs> a homing device on, on Kirk's back. Like no one saw that. Uh, I, uh, Iman is so great in that. It's just, it, <laughs> I can't believe I kissed you. Must've been your life's ambition. I mean, it's so, it's flyer part then. There's so many good things in Star Trek six. I love Star Trek six. And what's really interesting is the director's cut, of course, reveals Rene Ajumon wall, or however you say his last name as Colonel West, as one of the great co-conspirators in the plot to keep the, the Klingon, uh, the, 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 the plot between the, the, keep the war going. And it's interesting because he does not appear 
in the original version of Star Trek Six. He's only in the director's cut when he says, "We well, can clean their chronometers." I love that. It's great. <laughs> uh, Jane one one three eight says, "I once ran into you at the Hills Run Red SIF screening. That's the Seattle International Film Festival, and you talked a little bit about, a little bit about Free Enterprise Two. Any hints as to what it would have been about?" Well, it's, uh, thank you for coming to the the Hills Run Red screen. Hopefully this year, uh, if you know anyone at SIF, I've I've entered the Hills Run Red into consideration to hopefully have its world premiere at the Seattle International Film Festival. Hopefully they'll like it. Um, it might be a little too tame, but Seattle, the Seattle International Film Festival was is, is my home film festival. I went there as a kid religiously. I was a full series pass holder uh, every year, and it was such. It was so delightful to bring the Hills Run Red to its world premiere at the Seattle International Film Festival. Uh, it was great. Um, my mom wouldn't come, though. And she, it's probably best. My mom's like, I'm not going to go see that horror movie in a theater. I'm not going to go subject myself to this midnight show. I'm like, Mom, how many movies have I made in my life? I mean, you got you got the Cody Banks movies. I got, I got Free Enterprise. I got Hills Run Red. Now I got Tango Shalom. I've edited a lot of movies. But come on, Mom. She didn't come. Uh, but but so he'll, here's the story about Free Enterprise 2. First of all, William Shatner turns 88 years old on March 22nd. So good on Shatner. He's peak human male, I, I said on Twitter. Uh, we were very, very close to making Free Enterprise 2. There's an upcoming podcast called The Greatest Movies Never Made. That's uh, part of the 430 Movie Podcast on the Inglorious Trexperts podcast where we, Mark Altman and I go into this. We were two days away from principal photography on Free Enterprise 2 where we lost our funding. And I blame, I blame Jeffrey Coughlin, the producer of Pontypool, a movie I actually liked, and I met on the festival circuit with Hills Run Red. I blame him. He was he was not uh, forthright and magnanimous and upfront or telling us the truth, and we ended up losing our funding two days before principal photography on Free Enterprise: The Wrath of Shatner. And uh, uh, I'm still hoping. <laughs> hope springs eternal because Shatner's still around and I would love to make free enterprise the wrath of Shatner. Uh, if there's a few things, there's a few hurdles I have to, that I'm working on uh, overcoming, but I still would love to make free enterprise the wrath of Shatner. I think the script is great. Basically it's a story. Uh, uh, it's a story. I don't want to give anything away, but it's a story where William Shatner disappears and the characters from free enterprise go on a road trip to find him and it leads them to Europe, to Russia, to Spain, to Israel, New York, Las Vegas. It's a romp and uh, it's, it's great. And I hope I can make it some day. Uh, Mark C asks, Oh, you are, I already, I already answered that. Um, let's see. Flick talk is here. Uh, I hope anyone boycotting Captain Marvel also boycotts, all of Mel Gibson's flicks, otherwise they're hypocrites, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, look, people, people are dicks. You know, people do stupid shit. And and I, I like, I've always loved Mel Gibson. I'm a Jew, and he's, you know, he, if his father was anti-Semitic, but I've been dealing with people who hate Jews my whole life. I've heard because I don't look Jewish. I've heard some, I've heard so many nasty things that people have said to me, not knowing I'm Jewish, and I never say I'm Jewish usually because I don't want to start a fight, but you know, I'll bring it up to them later after they've said something. So they know they said it to me, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, Mel Gibson has a, mo a new movie. <clears throat> I think it's called dragged Aco across concrete that was made by the same director that made bone Tom Tomahawk and a uh, riot in cell block 99. And it's Vince Vaughn and, and Mel Brooks or Mel Brooks, Vince Vaughn and, and Mel Gibson. And I believe that the, uh, the tra the trailer did drop. I just watched the trailer. I, hell, I want to see it. Um, but yes, I, I, boycotting Captain Marvel. Why? Why would you not want to see Captain Marvel? What is first of all? What does the movie Captain Marvel really have to do with what Brie Larson said about people being more inclusive when it's she's going to see that there was that article that came out that most major film critics are are older white dudes. So why not want to encourage other people other than older white dudes who are already film critics? Why not get more people of color? Why not get more women in? Why not? What's wrong with that? I mean, in the long run, it's just going to give us more ideas floating around, more perspectives floating around. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that I want to read, I don't want every every uh, film reviewer to become like Armin White, but it's, 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 it's a good thing. More people having more opportunities to do the things they want to do 
is only it, it can only better society. It can only make us stronger as a people. So I don't understand. Like, you know, I, I've never understood. Everyone knows, by the way. It, like, I, I just I just don't get white supremacy, it, especially because if you've traveled around the world, there's all kinds of different people, and uh, there's all kinds of beautiful people, and 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 you know. I think one of the most beautiful women in the world is Lupita Nyong'o. I mean, come on, she's she's one of the most striking women I, women I've ever seen in my life. And you know why would why would you ever want to to not deny Lupita Nyong'o anything? I certainly wouldn't. Um, but I just think that I just think that you know diversity. When, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. But again, you can't trade one oppression for another. Now, you know, cis white males are we're going to be the punching bags for the next for so the rest of my life do I get to be an oppressed minority? I hope not because that would bum me out. But I mean, I understand where that's coming from. But you cannot you cannot make past wrongs right by oppressing people. You know, you, you can't. You have to move forward. We all have to move forward together. Um let's see. <clears throat> uh 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 Caledon Sound asks or is it Celadon Sound or Caledon Sound? Have you ever seen Halt and Catch Fire? I have not. I have not ever seen that. It was the best show nobody watched, including me. Uh, I, I've heard it's good, but I, I'd go back and watch something like that. I've heard, you know, a lot of people like that movie. I have not seen it. Um, uh, <laughs> um, hey, Rob, it's it's Little Nate. Started watching Umbrella. Little Nate, thanks for being here from Canada. Um started watching umbrella academy it's pretty out there and i love it also great show man where do you see where it goes where do you see where it goes uh i really i cannot i think um umbrella academy has an incredible cast i love it and it's truly bonkers and i think i would dare say i think it's better than the comic book uh Kate and Car 89 asks, did I ever find Ulysses 31 on YouTube? No, only because it's been a really busy week for me work-wise. So I have not, but I am going to. Uh, I will, because I'm I'm curious about it. So I want to see it. Um uh Robert, Captain Robert April says, Don't wait for the translation. Answer me now. It was a callback to Adelaide Stevenson during the UN Security Council hearing about the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> And then Robert April says, recommended viewing The Missiles of October, one of my favorite made-for-TV movies. And, and I think it was shot on videotape, so it kind of looks like a soap opera, an old, but it's it, The Missiles of October. It's so, it's so great. I think, will, didn't William Devane play JFK? Um, it's great. It's all about the Cuban Missile Crisis. I, I love the Cuban Missile. I mean, I didn't, don't love that the Cuban Missile Crisis happened, but I love the the whole... Uh, all of it, the missiles of since I was a kid, because I watched the missiles of October when it was first on as a child, and it seemed like it was very Star Trek to me. <laughs> um, but I loved it. It was a TV movie. If you can find it, it's probably on YouTube. Somebody's probably put the missiles of October on YouTube, and it's great. You got to watch it. Uh, everybody should watch that. Um, uh, real, re real girl. 26 says, why in the world do people care so much about social justice warrior issues and stuff like that? It's such a great time to be a geek. Man, I agree. And there's more there's more inclusion and there's more people allowed to do all of these things than ever before. But the problem is, here's the problem. There's a lot of, and I, I, tell you, I cop to this as a guy, I'm embarrassed by other guys. There's a lot of, 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 of guys out there that have deep-seated anger issues uh, about women and they, they aren't leave it living the lives they want to live and they're blaming other people you know and 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 that's the the vitriol ever since gamergate and the sad and rabid puppies fiasco at the hugos i've i've been sort of ashamed of all of this i've been ashamed of these guys because we are getting so much great stuff and it's all about how you choose to look at it i think i mean that's that's kind of what i would would say about that um Flick Talk does say, I don't see Mel's movies. You can't come back with what he said in my eyes. Well, you know, what he said, I'm, I, I, here's, here's the thing. I, I mean, I'm of, like, I like, everyone will tell you, I like everybody. Like, I'll find something to like about everyone. Uh, because I genuinely try, I, I know that, that everybody's experience of the world is different than my own. So I'm curious. I, I'm just inherently curious about, about people. 
Um, and that's why I was so attracted to making DVD documentaries was because I got to make documentaries about my favorite thing, which is movies and television. And I got to go meet people and travel around the world. So that was a great, that was a great thing for me to do. But, uh, I, I, there's a lot of people that aren't, you know, and, and I, I don't really understand it because in, in from my experience, I mean, look, I was jumped on the streets of Australia and I had the shit beat out of me by four guys. That wasn't cool, but it didn't put me off of Australia or Australians. You know, this was just a random occurrence. And, and in a way, in the long run, even though my nose is forever crooked and I still have a scar above my eye, uh, eye, eye, uh, eyebrow, I don't, it made me less afraid actually. And I had three crack ribs too. It was, I was a mess. But but in a way, I'm like, okay, now I don't have to be fearful at night because, like, I had a guy come up to me when I was going to Hollywood to do the Inglorious Trexperts podcast. He started following me around. I was I take the train into Hollywood, and I was uh, going to take the train because I can't get to Dean Devlin's studio. It's great. We, we record the Inglorious Trexperts podcast in Dean Devlin, Devlin's studio. He, of course, produced Independence Day and Stargate and uh, uh, Godzilla and makes librarians and he loves the podcast. So he, he allows us to, he, he gave us his office and he, he, he underwrites the podcast, which is great. But there was a guy that walked up and he started following me and he literally lifted up his um, shirt and I could see he had a pretty large knife in his, in his uh, uh, pants and he didn't pull the knife out, but I stopped and I just stared him straight down and I was like, buddy, you better walk away and walk away right now. And he did. I mean, he had a screw loose, but I don't know if I would have done that had I not been jumped before because um, I wouldn't have that courage. But now I don't, now I'm, I'm in a way I've sort of become like Jeff Bridges and fearless. If someone fucks with me on the street, I don't, I, I, I will not back down. I mean, if someone has a gun and blows me away, that'll be my own fault. But you know, it's, I've sort of had this experience and I just look, to me, Mel, Mel Gibson has made too much great work. And and look, he's also made things like Braveheart and Apocalypto. And I know from his work that he's not, look, is he an anti-Semite? I don't know. I mean, he said a horrible, bunch of horrible things. He had a drinking problem. I've said a lot of stupid shit when I was drunk. But I enjoy his films. I, I, I've i met him. You know, I've met him when I worked at Warner Brothers. And uh, a couple of times when he was working on Lethal Weapon 3. And uh he couldn't have been nicer and he, you know he 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 got ensorcelled by a russian woman <laughs> i know what that's like uh but so i but i agree with you i mean it's it's really hard it's really hard to to make the the i'm i'm a huge fan of roman polanski but it's very difficult to be a fan of roman polanski when he did what he did and he did what he did he admitted to it and it's it's really difficult and can you ever think of him in in in, in the, that way or as an artist again the thing is when i watch his movies i'm not thinking about roman polanski the person thinking about the movies it's really it's tough it's really it's a hard it's a hard thing to get over but you know in our society we do the way we met out justice people are are convicted they serve their time and then they come out do you do you punish them forever um once they serve their time i don't know it's tough it's tough uh, uh captain robert april asks if masada is still part of the plot no uh <laughs> masada is in israel but israel is still a very a big part of the he's talking about free enterprise too we still do go to israel in the script and uh, a big event happens in israel but we don't go to masada uh, i'll tell you actually the genesis of where free enterprise 2 came from and this will this will so I think it was when I was working on the Star Trek V DVD and I did an interview with Shatner and recorded his audio commentary. And, and I think I might've asked him, I said, you know, we've been trying to come up with an idea for free enterprise Two, bill. And you've kind of become the version of bill Shatner that was in the original free enterprise. So if we ever made another free enterprise, what is it you would see the character of bill Shatner? Where would he go? Like, what would he do? And I kid you not. Bill Shatner thought about it and he says, what if, what if Bill Shatner was a rabbi? <laughs> I was like, okay, okay. 
And then one day we tell the story one day, Mark and I, after, after, uh, Jeffrey Coughlin told us he could get us the money to make free enterprise too. And we really started to have to, we, we dabbled with the script over the years, but this was in, uh, late 2009. Uh, we started writing the script and, and we were, we were having a um, brunch and his uh, Mark's son was young son had just been born and he was there with us. Cutest kid in the world. And it was like, Mark and I are like, oh, what would we do? What would, what would Bill Shatner as a rabbi? What, where, where, where can we take that? And it was so funny. It was like, I don't know if it was because of Mark's son was gurgling or whatever. We both looked and like at the same time, ping, this realization hit us. And it was a very sort of, Dr. Strange Lovian idea of what William Shatner as a rabbi would do. And then the, the script just, we were off to the races and banged it out. And it's, it's pretty hilarious. And I hope that we get to make it one day. Um, Doc Civil says Shatner essentially said he doesn't have the wherewithal to work on a weekly adventure show anymore. I think that shows an incredible amount of self-awareness. Don't you, you know, Shatner's a machine. I mean, he goes, he, he every weekend he's hosting screenings of, of wrath of Khan. He's probably coming to a, a city near you. The guy's amazing. I, I think at his age, he's just got to keep moving. He's like a shark. He's got to keep moving or for fear. He might not be around anymore. God, I hope that never happens, but I think that might be some of it. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, flick talk says non white people are the hottest people in the world. Laugh out loud. Well, I, I, I would as, 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 uh, Spock would say, I would not presume to debate you. Yeah, I've been all around the world. I, I think there's there's hot people everywhere of all shapes, sizes, colors, and creeds. And man, let me tell you, I you know, I'm I'm a fan of I, I love people of of mixed heritage as well. Wow. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. You know, and eventually humanity will get there. <laughs> we'll figure that shit out. Uh I hope so. Um C. Kruger says, has Doomcock or Teddy Rubskins <laughs> channel contacted you? Well, no, I was on a I was on a uh, Midnight's Edge podcast. You know, it's funny that 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 they there's a lot of people in the fan community and people that I like that there's I didn't realize how acrimonious some people find the Midnight's Edge channel. I, I really have liked watching their videos, whether they're all true or not. I mean, I watch them, I watch a lot of things. And, you know, you make up your own mind. I'm constantly, look, every morning I go to the Drudge Report and I go to CNN and the BBC. <laughs> and that's where I start my 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 journey of, of, and I read things on both sides. I read conservative commentators. I watch what I think is the ridiculousness on uh, from Fox News and compare and contrast, whether you look at the Young Turks or you watch Dave Rubin. I mean, you have to watch, to me, I'm, I'm just a culture junkie. And I like, even though I, I'm certainly not a a conservative or, or right winger and by any stretch of the imagination i like to understand there have been conservative people you know like william f buckley i thought was a terrific uh uh thinker and and i think there's there's this idea that you should only the, the internet has unfortunately made it so people can design what they like and and get only information that that feeds into the, in their own to their own points of view and i think that's a waste of time I mean, the whole point is, is I want to know what the other side is saying and what the other side is thinking. So I'm learning, you know, and, and, and you always should have your views, whatever you view as true and whatever you think is right. You should never stop allowing your own views to come up to scrutiny, whether it's this a scrutiny of other people's, but most uh, especially scrutiny of yourself. You should constantly be examining your beliefs and wondering what you think about things. You know, again, I've been reading this book called Sapiens. And because um, I've been reading a, a lot of other people have been talking about this book for a while. It's it's one of those books that uh, it's a nonfiction book. I usually get nonfiction books filtered down to me later because I read so many novels uh, and science fiction, fantasy, horror, comics, whatever. So a big nonfiction book like Sapiens, I'll hear about in the whisper stream, you know, and you'll be like, oh, I got to read that book. And I got uh, Sapiens and the book Homo Deus that he wrote afterwards. And, and Sapiens is wonderful. And I can't stop thinking, what is a religious person? If you believe that the earth is, what does a fundamentalist Christian think of Sapiens? If they're reading it, do they get angry? Do they read a page or two into it and throw it against the wall? I'm always curious about that. Uh, it, it's, it's, but so no, the answer is no, I haven't been contacted by the channel. Uh, but I look, I thought Midnight's Edge's, um, uh, uh, interview with, with Nicholas Meyer was really cool. You know, I liked it. 
Uh, Mark C says, in a world of swatting, doxing, and ruining people's lives, to simply decide to protest with your wallet is what people are being upset about. Yeah, no, I I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. But I think it's the reason people are upset that is it, it's upsetting to me. Like, look, we we live in a country where people are all allowed to have their own their own viewpoints. And I'm like, you know, if you're a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, why would you deprive yourself of that? of the joy of seeing, presumably the joy of seeing Captain Marvel, just because actress Brie Larson, I mean, Captain Marvel is not Brie Larson. Brie Larson is an actor that was reading words that were written for her and wearing a costume that was designed for her and, and working with actors that are her fellow actors. I mean, I, I've never judged, I, I've always tried to separate myself uh, from the art and the artist because look, all human beings at, on some level are, we're all deeply flawed and damaged and we have wacky stuff going on in our, in our own way. And what Brie Larson was asking for, I mean, again, uh, this idea that men like white men, like myself, we've, we've had a pretty good, you know, we, 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 we have not always been the greatest people in the world. Now I think it's, again, I think it's ridiculous to trade one oppression for another. And the idea that you're going to blame uh, white men which is sort of silly because really you should just blame all men because throughout history, it's all men who have done bad things at some point. It depends where you want to, do you want to, you want to talk about what the Japanese did to the, the Chinese in world war two? I mean, Jesus Christ, or what the Khmer Rouge did, you know, or, or it, it's like we've, everybody's committed atrocities throughout history and, and men have, have, have committed horrible atrocities against women and do every day now. Um, but, but look again, we all, hopefully we'll all start getting better and, 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 and I, I, the world is, is pretty, it's getting, it's it, on one hand, I don't understand. We're getting, we have better technology, better communications. I mean, hell Israel just launched it's a, 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 a moon probe that's going to land they, a private citizen in, in Israel, a private group, a, a private group has launched the first moon probe from Israel. They're going to become the fourth country in the world to land a probe on on moon on the moon and it was privately funded. How cool is that on a SpaceX rocket? So Elon Musk's rocket that he builds here in California, you know, is is now taking a, a, an Israeli space probe uh, aloft to the moon and they will become the fourth country in the world to land a probe on the moon. <laughs> We live in, in great times. Everyone's mad all the time. I don't get it. We should be doing great things. We we should be doing great things. Uh, and we are. We are. We are doing great things. Um, but yes, doxing, swatting, ruining people's lives. It's like, why do you want to do that? It's, it's just unbelievable to me. Uh, Captain Robert April says that Shatner is at Pensacon this weekend. Of course he is. God bless that guy. Caledon Sound says, what are your thoughts on third-party figures? I'm a huge Transformers masterpiece collector, and I have a load of MP-scaled, unlicensed figures. Great quality. Okay. That's a very good question. What Caledon's asking about, or Celadon, if I'm pronouncing it wrong, what he's asking, or she, I, I presume you're a guy. Uh, I can't see uh, far. Uh, you look like a guy to me. And and by the way, those Transformers MP-scaled uh, uh, figures, the masterpiece Transformers figures are great. Here is the thing. I grew up in a world where they made very few licensed properties. And like they were always making, I was always buying like how many, how many unlicensed Star Trek blueprints did I buy? I mean, it, they would, people make blueprints of everything. They, they all followed the Franz Joseph designs blueprints that came out in 75, but, but they weren't manufacturing Klingon D7 blueprints or blueprints of the grain ships from the animated episode, more troubles, more troubles, but you, I would buy them. They were unlicensed and nobody was going to buy. There's all kinds of unlicensed model kits that I buy. And unfortunately I buy unlicensed action figures. Is it stealing? Yes, it is stealing. Unlicensed properties are stealing. But on the other hand, the only people that are making, no one is getting rich making unlicensed action figures. They're not. They're basically covering their costs. You know, they're action figure fans that are making these things that want to see them made. Like, look, I want the crew of the Nostromo in in, in six scale. I don't know if anyone's going to get it. I was happy Hot Toys put out a Ripley, but I want a Yafit Koto. I want a Parker. 
<laughs> you know, I want a Harry Dean Stanton. I want a Tom Skerritt. I want a Veronica Cartwright. But nobody's there's no money in making 12-inch figures of the Nostromo crew, aside from the few idiots like myself that would want to buy them. And that's why I go to places like the Monkey Depot. If you go to the monkeydepot.com, uh, they sell unlicensed kits. You can get garage kits. I mean, I, 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 like I've got unlicensed kits or unlicensed action figures of Maximus from Gladiator, and they're finally uh, – Big Chief in the UK is putting out a Maximus figure finally. I've got a Maximus Roman general from the opening of Gladiator and then his, his arena combat gear with the helmet. So my thoughts are, yes, is it wrong to, to buy uh, unlicensed figures? It is. But if they're not going to make the figures, then why shouldn't you buy – because look, being a fan, we're you're already supporting, the, you're already buying the legal shit that's out there. Now, this logic, people would be like, "Oh, Burnett, you know, he's he's advocating stealing." It's look, I, if somebody made twelve inch figures of Logan and and Francis and Jessica from Logan's Run or and Box, I would buy them. I would buy them. No reputable. Uh, company Hot Toys is not going to make Logan's Run figures. Sideshow Toys is not going to make Logan's Run figures because there's not enough people out there who would buy them. You know, I mean, I'd love to get those figures. Yeah, I, I, I would, but no one's making them, and the people that are making them are the fans. And look, I, uh, I'm still now involved in litigation regarding Axonar and and I, I, IP and everything and all that, but it's 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 um it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. But again, you know, you can't make any, there's a lot of unlicensed figures that you're probably getting that you want that they're not going to make officially because why would they, you know, they're probably eighth tier characters. I'm not sure which characters you have, but man, I, I buy bootleg shit all the time. <laughs> Toy, I've been doing it my whole life because people aren't going to like, I have, there's a guy named Randy Cooper who I love. Randy Cooper makes resin model kits. He makes a star destroyer that I have. That's like this big. I haven't built it yet. He makes a Blade Runner spinner. There's an official Blade Runner spinner that came out of model kits like this week, but his is like this big. I have a Galileo sh seven shuttlecraft that he made. He, he he's look, look at all the. I, I'm now become obsessed. I haven't uh, done this yet, but there's like brickyards on YouTube. It's a it's a it's a Lego YouTube channel, and they sell just instructions. Uh, they have this sand crawler that's like this big, and for like sixty four bucks. They'll sell you the instructions. That's it. You just get the instructions. But somebody had to figure out how to build that big of it. It's awesome. And then you have to go buy the Lego parts. Now, is that officially licensed? I don't even know. I mean, it is Star Wars. If they call it like, I don't know, the sand tank. <laughs> and and that's how they get away with a lot of this stuff. Like, I'm also fascinated by all the, the Chinese ripoff Legos, which I will not buy Chinese ripoff Legos. I love Legos. I believe in supporting the company. Uh, but on the other hand, then somebody tells sends me a link. Hey, you know, you can get the Star Destroyer, Darth Vader Star Destroyer, which is no longer in print by Lego. You can buy Chinese Legos for like a hundred bucks. You can get the Executor kit. And if you want to go to YouTube or, or eBay to get it, it's like 1200 bucks. I mean, that's then I'm like, uh, I might have to like my own, my own sticking up for Lego. I might have to put that aside. I don't know. It's a tough issue. As you can see, I'm passionate about it. Um, King's Portal Cal says, Rob, I've watched you for years on Heroes. I've loved you and Schnepp's interaction talking about hot toys. I recently rewatched all the Heroes episodes that involved Schnepp. Favorite hot toy. Wow, that's tough. There's so many that look, there's so many hot toys that I love. My favorite hot toy is Vito Corleone from The Godfather. And I, just because I The Godfather is one of my favorite movies, I can't believe Hot Toys made a Vito Corleone figure. It's it's worth uh, a ton of money. It's hard to get. I love the figure. Uh, it's great. And uh, that's probably my favorite, my favorite hot toy. But then again, you know, the Hulkbuster, the Hulkbuster, and they're re-releasing the Hulkbuster. I mean, there's so, there's so many good ones. Uh, I really like the look. I don't know if she, it looks so much like Brie Larson, but that Captain Marvel figure that they they just dropped or that that's coming out. That's an amazing, amazing figure. I like a lot of that diecast Iron Man figures they're great uh, i that i want to get that infinity war die cast iron man figure in the worst way uh so but thanks for those kind words about schnepp too nicholas glenn says i'm all for diversity 
First of all, thank you, Nicholas, for the super chat. I'm all for diversity, but against forced diversity when it makes the story a character or job position suffer. All hail Doomcock. Laugh out loud. There is, after all, by the way, there's Gilbert. Uh, and I think I said up front that this marks one year that Gilbert has been named Gilbert. We got Gilbert one year and five days ago. I actually had called Gilbert Truffaut for five days uh, while we had him. And everyone kind of liked that idea, but it was clear because I'm a Francois Truffaut fan. And my last cat, my last pet that I had was Kubrick, but she passed away. Um, but but he just wasn't a Truffaut. His sweetly goofy personality, he's, he's, a, he's a character, that one. And so my girlfriend, Elizabeth, came up with the name Gilbert or Gilbert, if you can speak French. And I'm like, you know what? He's a total Gilbert. And then, then I started calling him Gilbert the Gilbertian from the planet Gilbar, just because I make up stupid nicknames for everyone. So Gilbert... Today marks the one-year anniversary of Gilbert being Gilbert. Uh, but Nicholas, what you're talking about, uh, you're talking all. I, I am, I am all for diversity. I am against forced diversity, as you are. Uh, and when it makes the story, the character, or job position suffer. But you know, I think there's also, I think there's a lot of finger pointing going on that isn't exactly true. You know, I don't think that they made Captain Marvel for social any kind of social justice reasons. You know, once Wonder Woman proved that, and I've always believed that a female protagonist would, th there's been just as many movies where male protagonists, those movies fail. So the idea that that you can't have a female protagonist is sort of silly, but for every reboot of, of for every Wonder Woman you get, you get a reboot of Lara Croft, which didn't do as well as it should have. But Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers is a kick-ass character. I love her as part, as part of the Avengers and this incarnation of Carol Danvers. So it made sense to me that they made this movie. But I don't think anyone is – storytellers are trying to tell the best story possible. I don't think – you know, Black – they don't they didn't make Black Panther as, as some diversity movie. I mean, they made Black Panther because Black Panther is a kick-ass Marvel character. They, of course, you know, they want to have more diversity of characters because that makes sense. And Black Panther is a great character. They had a great take on Black Panther. Black Panther is portrayed in Civil War was awesome. He was awesome. Chad Bozeman was awesome as Black Panther. So it made sense that Black Panther was turned in or spun off into his own movie. And of course, being from Wakanda, you know, it's not like they sat down and said, well, we've got to make this, this all black movie because we have to, we're pushing diversity. I don't think that was what they were doing. They just made a movie, a kick ass movie like Black Panther, but because of the actual story and what it was supposed to be and what Black Panther was all about, it's a movie that's set in Africa. Which So how great is that? I mean, remember, I'm the gatekeeper of verisimilitude, and aside from some dodgy effects in Black Panther, I think they did a fantastic job. I mean, you know, to bitch that they have the Tolkien white guy in it, get it? Tolkien white guy. I mean, it, it's just, I just don't think that, um, actually there's two Tolkien white guys in Black Panther, but I, but I, I, what I like is when something is, is organic to the story and, and the fact that there's a group of people that never in their lives had a movie like Black Panther, uh, ever with that kind of representation in that, in, in a movie that is how great is that you get, you get great stuff and it's, it's, it's great all around, but, but yeah, I think, look, all stories have agendas. All stories are pushing certain agendas, whether whether they're ideological, political, narrative. There's always an agenda behind a story because you're telling a story for a specific reason, you know. But I think you want to you want to make it allegorical and not heavy handed. Heavy handed, anything heavy handed, whether it's whatever issue it is, whether it's political, whether it's it's about racial diversity or or LBGT issues, whatever it is, pushing an issue at the forefront is never a good thing. It's never great storytelling. You want your issues to flow into the storytelling organically so the audience doesn't realize that they're getting the issues in their story. And those are what the best writers do. Um, let's see. Uh, 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 Keladon Sound says, oh, Yuval Noah Harari is one of our best thinkers. Yes, sir. Uh, um, Yuval Noah Harari is the author of Sapiens and uh, Homo Deus, the books I'm reading, my camera's on top of it right now. Um, but it's they're phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, the book is so wildly entertaining. Uh, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, Charlie Rogers is here. Thank you, Charlie. Look, I'm totally okay with their comments. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. 
people are too sensitive to words these days. Amen, brother. Amen. People are too sensitive to words today. Don't you think so, Gilbert? Are people... Here, Gilbert, come on up. Let's see if Gilbert will have so much to say. Come here, buddy. Come on up. Oh, he's walking away. I guess he doesn't want to talk about people and diversity. But uh, I was hoping you... Here, come on up, dude. You want to come up? Come on up. Yeah, come on. Come on. Good boy. There he is. Here's Gilbert, everyone. Uh, he's a year. He's been Gilbert now for a year. What do you think, buddy? Do you know you've been Gilbert for a year? I I, I, I don't think he... Oh, he's a little tired. Oh, buddy. How you doing, buddy? Yeah. So everyone, here's Gilbert. He's been Gilbert for a year. Uh, I never thought I'd love a creature as much as I love this dog. But yeah, I I, uh, I don't understand why people can't talk to each other anymore. I mean, it's so weird. that What I saw happen at my alma mater, the Evergreen State College, was one of the most disgusting displays uh, of, uh, I don't even know. I can't, I don't know why people can't talk to each other. I mean, isn't that why we're here? Isn't that how discourse is supposed to happen? I mean, I've never been fearful. If somebody says something to me that I find completely offensive, I've never been fearful of like, let's discuss this. I'm like, I'm never like, fuck you. What is that? I mean, yeah, but you're right. The art of conversation and you follow it up here. Charlie follows this up by saying sticks and stones and all that. I'm a conservative. I wouldn't be able to watch movies if I boycotted actors with comments I didn't agree with. Laugh out loud. Love everything you do, sir. Well, Charlie, first of all, I'm happy that to hear you say that you're a conservative and that you're here and that you watch me because there are conservative thinkers that, like I said, William F. Buckley, that I'm a fan of. You know, there's a lot of a lot of great discourse out there uh, that I like to watch, and I, I think you know if you're not if if you're not listening to great conservative thinkers, you're missing out on on. Look, there are there are also I am not. Um, I believe in some of the core Republican values. I don't think where the Republican Party is now is where I want to where where I want to be, which is why I vote Democrat. But there are there have been Republicans, especially like hey Abraham Lincoln, uh, that I have been fans of, and and I think that that great thinkers are there are great thinkers all around us, and it it, it it's frustrating when people yell and scream at each other and and the discourse like I love seeing videos like inside the UK's Parliament where these guys are are women or they're all going at each other, you know, and it's, 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 I want to see the, my problem now is, is that so much of our political discourse is bought and paid for by special interest, which I think is a problem because no special interests have the interests of the, of the, of the individual. Uh, I, I am most of all a fan of, of the individual, the sovereign rights of the individual more than anything. And uh, it just identity politics and tribalism and all that, it's it's not good for anybody, I don't think. And and uh, <laughs> Mark C says, I now need another dog name, Sullivan. <laughs> yes, I've often thought that. I, I think it'd be kind of kind of funny um, for those of you who don't know what Mark C is talking about. The great uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. I was actually I played Major General Stanley in the Pirates of Penzance in elementary school. Believe it or not. Um. So let's see. Uh, uh, Mark C asks, have you read the John Byrne IDW Star Trek photo novels? I have. Okay. Okay. For those who don't know, IDW, which now controls the Star Trek comic franchise, and they've done a phenomenal job. IDW has done a great job. I just read uh, the Tipton Brothers' new Q, the, the, I think it's called the Q War or something, the Q, Q Conflict, uh, the first issue of that, it's, which is really good. But uh, so John Byrne, the John Byrne, like the comic artist, next men, John Byrne, X-Men, John Byrne, Fantastic Four, John Byrne, Avengers, John Byrne, the great John Byrne has been recreating photo novels, the old photo novels from the 70s where they would before vi videotape, they would basically give you all these stills from every episode and all the, they would have thought bubbles and you could read an episode. Well, what John Byrne has done is he's gone into the original series, Star Trek, and he's taken all of these he takes frame grabs. And then he uses the frame grabs as panels for storytelling. So he's re he's telling brand new stories, but he's using footage from the original episodes to do so. So instead of drawing, he's using episode images. And but sometimes he mixes and matches the episodes in one photo novel, and kind of drives me crazy. But they're pretty cool, <laughs> and I like them. And uh, yes, I uh, you know how could I not how could I not like them? Um. <laughs> is the head of Alec Peters behind you to the left? <laughs> no, 
No, that's of course the big chap. Trek 001 says that. That is very funny. Trek 001. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's funny. Mark C asks, I bought tail, uh, I bought a bootleg Tales of the Gold Monkey TV show. Once production copies are relief released, I always replace. I right, look, man, I agree. You know, I've got all the the Super Seven, the the robot shows like Guy King and and uh, Star Avengers and all these these seventy super robot shows that have never been released officially on video. Here, I bought them from some guy in in, in like Saudi Arabia or something. Made them. C. <laughs> uh, uh, Kruger says, "Have you seen the episode one doc Star Weight uh, and the twelve commentaries? I haven't. I've seen Star Woids because I was in it." Uh, I was actually in it. Uh, Daniel Alter uh, <laughs> did that documentary, uh, and he's in it. He was waiting in line for like four months in Westwood. Um, now, here's the thing. You know, the Tales of the Gold Monkey thing, if it's not out, if it's not available and people want it, you know, then what are you going to do, man? Um, Caledon Sound says, exactly, man. Takara aren't putting out an MP Rekgar anytime soon. I do feel bad getting unlicensed too, but I, I've got the collecting bug and I need more. Look, you know, th some there have been unlicensed, recent unlicensed six scale figures of, of Magneto from the X-Men of Professor X. Uh, no one's making those. You know, the only X-Men characters that you could get from Hot Toys are Deadpool uh, and um, Wolverine, but they didn't even do a Wolverine for Logan. Other people have. My man Cliff Stevenson got a, a, a an unlicensed Logan. I would like to buy Hot Toys Logan. I would, but you can't. So it's unlicensed. But I, you know, I, I, uh, I, um, yeah. Let's see. There's there's more of these. Uh, uh, what did I miss? Uh, let's see. Uh, no, there's more. I don't want to miss any of these super chat questions people have been asking me about. Um, man, this one's this one's gone on long. This one's gone on long. So um, uh, MS MG MGS Big Oh MGS Big Boss seventy seven says prior to Star Wars, people seem to forget that it was the original Planet of the Apes film series, which sold an insane amount of toys. George must have taken notes, and Twentieth Century Fox didn't. Yeah, for those of you who who might not know this, there was a great toy company called Mego, which there is an episode of the Toys That Made Us about Mego. And by the way. I was in a Target yesterday, and Mego, I believe they're distributing through Target, only to Target. Mego is back with a vengeance, and they're making both their 8-inch figures and they're making 12-inch figures, 6-scale figures. I saw that they had made a, a, a Zod, and they had made a Green Lantern, and they're pretty cool. I mean, look, I'm only, I'm only Hot Toys. I'm Hot Toys only, although I'll buy other sideshow figures too, like when they put out a Jack Burton or something. But it's great to see me go back with a vengeance. But they made an incredible line, a great line of Planet of the Apes figures, mostly around the time they were mostly basically they were for the television show that I was 1974. I believe that's when Mego put out they had Planet of the Apes tree houses and all kinds of stuff. They had great Planet of the Apes figures, and I, I loved like General Ursus and all that. They they made great figures. That was that was a great toy line. But yeah, I think George Lucas probably took See nobody the the funny thing about that was is that movie related toy lines were never big. They didn't penetrate into they didn't they weren't mass they didn't sell on a big mass scale. So, he was a visionary in that way. But uh yeah, so I agree with you there on that. I think I'm going to wrap this up because I have work to do. I got to make some phone calls since I've been doing this chat. Oh, the blue corner is here. The blue corner. Hi, blue corner. What did Dave mean by there's no chance the Hills Run Red will ever get a Blu-ray release? Saw it again today on YouTube. Uh, man, that one line baby face. I got to, you know, that baby, you're right, blue corner. That guy, he, he's so talented. The, the baby face figure he made, it's like, it's like 900 bucks. If I had the money, I'd drop it. You know, I'd drop it on that because hell, I nurtured that project and produced that project. I was in Bulgaria producing that project with Dave Barker. Here's the thing. I don't know. I don't know why there's no Blu-ray of The Hills Run Red. Uh, I believe it's the only Dark Castle movie until they moved out of, out of Warner Brothers. It's not on Blu-ray. I think there's somebody kind of the way you can't get Ken Russell's The Devils the uncut on Blu-ray. I think someone's got it out for The Hills Run Red. Um, I'd love to see it. I know you can get an HD like on Vudu, 
and I I, I want to figure out how to download download it, buy it, and burn myself a Blu-ray. But it's it's really irksome to me. I'll tell you something else. I made a documentary. It's on the Blu-ray. Uh, when I went to Bulgaria, they weren't going to pay really for a, a behind the scenes documentary being made. So I took my own video camera and um, I shot my own documentary. They shot a few interviews. The studio shot a few interviews with the cast. But I did. I shot my own, own own documentary, and it's on the DVD. You can get the DVD of, of Hills Run Red, but not the Blu-ray. I don't understand, and it drives me insane. Um, <laughs> Sean Finnegan says, I just read the Alec Peters lawsuit. My God, how can he be serious filing that tripe? I hope you will go after his financial records as part of discovery. Uh, yes, it's been I, – I can't comment on the ongoing legality of this, but yes, Alec Peters, my once great friend and – compatriot on uh axinar has sued me uh this is by the way the second legal action he's taken against me in uh six months he threatened to sue me back in september and october and i had to spend thousands of dollars with my own lawyer defending myself and then when i when my lawyer asked for proof of what alec peters uh was saying there was no proof provided and alec's lawyer quit Drop the case. So Alec Peters, but it was not an official lawsuit yet. Alec Peters has officially, by the way, this is the same Alec Peters who is trying to raise money from people um, <laughs> to pay for a studio that he has not made a movie in since he's been there for two years. Uh, and I, I think it's rather absurd. And I will have lots to say about it. My lawyer uh, already has, I haven't even been served for the lawsuit. So technically I have not received a, sur a suit at all. Uh, I, I was, uh, people forwarded me the actual legal documents, which I forwarded to my lawyer and we will be, of course, uh, it, it is an absurd lawsuit. The guy takes 15, $1.5 million of donor money. And, and I'm the only, by the way, I'm the only person who actually made everything that ever came out of Axnar Productions. I edited and finished, uh, <laughs> prelude and everything after that. Uh, I made it all. So it's ridiculous. And by the way, he's, he's coming after me for making not making an, a disc, an Axnar Origins disc, for a feature film that was never made. <laughs> so yeah, you guys, I encourage you, if you want to go to the Ax, read Axa Monitor, you can find out all about it. But yeah, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty outrageous uh, lawsuit, considering especially how many podcasts did I do about Axnar and and uh with alec but yeah it's all it's all very interesting it's a real waste of time and it's certainly a waste of my money i mean i live here with uh, two teenage girls and we're always trying to make ends meet and you know trying to make rent and this is is, is pretty pretty disgusting in my mind but that's okay you know you aren't you aren't anyone in hollywood unless you get sued uh let's see today's cultural news Hey, Rob, I'm a conservative Christian, even though I might not always agree with you or John Campion on politics. I really respect and enjoy both of your shows and chats. Again, first of all, today's cultural news. I First of all, thank you for being here. And second of all, it means a lot that you say that. I have many conservative Christian friends. My sister, Colleen, is uh, walks with the Lord, and, and she is was born again. And one of my mentors when I was uh, at wor working at Warner Brothers, the great Penelope Foster. Uh, she got me my open study Bible. I have a beautiful Bible. And I would go with her to the church on the way, and I would see Pastor Jack Hayford preach on, on Sundays because I really enjoyed listening to his sermons. And again, I, I think you cannot understand Western culture without knowing your Bible. Some of the great, I've told people, one of my favorite stories of all time is, is the story of Job, um, and not Robert Heinlein's book, Job, A Comedy of Justice, the Bible story about Job. And, and I think that, you know, again, uh, I think so few, you know, real conservative Christians that, that, that know the word of God and, and can quote their Bible, not just, not just a verse in Leviticus to prove that, oh, you know, all gay people are terrible or something like that. I, you know, people that really understand the Bible, what I love about my open study Bible is there's all these study chapters and it's, it's very interesting. So, so I, I, I respect and admire people who are, uh, have a strong faith. I have another friend, Dave DeVos, who's a filmmaker, who is a devout Christian. Uh, there are Ralph Winter, who produced all of the X-Men movies and produced a lot of the Star Trek movies, is a devout Christian. So I, there are many people in my life that I admire who are 
uh, conservative Christians, and I, I, I like them very much. And everybody here, all of you members of the post-geek post singularity are welcome at these chats. I just expect everyone, I hope that whoever's here, that you're all just respectful uh, of everyone else because otherwise, why would I even, even be here? So I appreciate you chiming in and saying that. Um, uh, you Oh, and you say, can you go on to say, I sincerely see you and John as a couple of guys I could sit down and have a couple of beers with great movie and political discussions with would be had by all. I agree. You know, and I, and I really appreciate political discourse when it's coming from a religious perspective, because while I was raised Jewish, I'll, I had other friends. One of my great friends uh, is cat was Catholic. So I would go to church and I was fascinated by uh, like, I love the history of the Vatican and yes. Okay. You can be, you, you can be cynical about it and talk about how, you know, religions of the world have, have brought a lot of misery to people. Yes, they have, but they've also brought a lot of of joy and happiness to people as well. And and uh, again, it's another perspective and another point of view that I appreciate, especially when it's well, when somebody of great religious faith is also well spoken, knowledgeable, and smart. Uh, I like that very much because I learn a lot. Um. Uh, <laughs> Aaron Johnson says, Rob, thoughts on Star Trek for the Voyage Home? I love Star Trek for the Voyage Home. I mean, I, you know, there, I have a love-hate relationship with it, actually. I think it's a little goofy, and I do not like the fact that they tell jokes. I don't like when Uhura and Chekhov don't know where Alameda is. Where the, that's what I said, Alameda. Like, I don't, they're badasses. They would have no problem knowing where everything was. They've been to San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, it's like, why, what, you don't know where it is? You would know. <laughs> Starfleet Academy. Come on, man. Um, Sanity's Radical says, I spent years studying the Bible, the Torah, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Quran. It's why I don't buy any of it, but no hate towards those who do get value from the religion. See, that's, again, sanity right there. That's a, a sane thing to say. Um, I, uh, I I think that's, uh, that is correct. I think you're right about that. You, you respect everybody, and you've learned about it and made up your own mind. Um, yeah. Uh, Reese Williams is here. He says, I was talking to my brother-in-law about ultraviolet going out of business. And he was saying it was ahead of its time. I remember when I was really young. Yeah, you, you probably, you probably are right about that. I mean, what you're talking about is the ultraviolet uh, movie storage system where people could store their films and studios are taking that away. Unfortunately, that's another service because, you know, they don't want to own anything. They don't want us to own anything. Uh, anyway, um, okay, I'm going to bring this chat to an end. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you for all the, the super chats. Thank you for, it's, it's been, a, this has been a good Friday. I was just going to talk about action figures. It's been almost two hours. That's crazy. Anyway, I want to thank you all for being here. There's been a lot of people here today. Uh, this was a great chat. I really appreciate your time and your support. And, you know, again, follow me. Please subscribe to this channel. Uh, if you like these chats, tell your friends. Uh, you can support me on Patreon. You can you can all, just go to my website, theburnetwork.net. By the way, I'm accused of not producing work uh, for Axnar. But if you go to my website, theburnetwork.net, and I have three documentaries that total almost 50 minutes of the Axnar feature film, the never-to-be-seen Axnar feature film, that uh, they they that I had made, and, and I encourage you all if you're interested. This lawsuit with my former patriot compatriot Alec Peters is going to be probably public. What a waste of time! All I can say is it was a lot of fun to work with Tobias Richter, who was working on Axanar. Uh, it was a lot of fun to work with him on the movie Sky Fighter, the short film Sky Fighter that we hope is a proof of concept for a feature that we finished this week, and we do our final mix on Tuesday. So it was great to do that, and it's great to be finishing Tango Shalom. Because, you know, real filmmakers make films. They don't sue people in court. You know, they don't. And especially when those people are supposed to be making movies that their donors gave them $1.5 million for. Yeah, you know, there's better ways to spend your time and money. And there's better ways for me to be spending my time and money, certainly not fighting a lawsuit against a former compatriot of mine who I stuck by through his own lawsuit to great detriment to my professional and personal reputation. But that'll all come out in the wash because, you know what, I've already been through a huge lawsuit, and I win them. So anyway, 
Uh, we'll see. But I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks for being supportive, and thanks for being supportive of each other. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you haven't heard yet. So all you have to do is listen. Thanks very much, guys. I probably will be here uh, back on Saturday and Sunday to talk about something scintillating. I'm still only up to G with my list of I've got to do G. Uh, maybe I'll do that tomorrow. But anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks for being here, and I will see you guys later.